Hello and welcome back to my course Amiga Hardware Programming in C. This episode will be an introduction to the Amiga's famous blitter. When I was a kid, I remember when it came to telling my friends what was so great about the Amiga, the blitter would have been right on top of the list. It was one of the main reasons why the Amiga's graphics were so amazingly fast for the time. Hardware blitters were invented to copy memory blocks quickly, which is especially useful for graphical user interfaces and games. The Amiga splitter was not the first splitter in existence, however it was the first one used in a generally available personal computer system. This is the Amiga blitter patent. If you know a little bit about the Amiga's history, some of these gentlemen listed on the patent might sound familiar to you. Fun fact to mention here, Joe De Cure, who lives in the Seattle area, stopped by my workplace a couple of years ago and we spent some time chatting about his work on the Amiga chipset. The Amiga Splitter is known for three main functions. The most important one is copying rectangular memory blocks quickly and it offers quite a bit of options for doing so. In addition to that, we can use the Splitter to fill areas and draw lines. In this episode, I will focus on the memory copying aspects of the Splitter. I will talk about area fill and line draw in a separate video. While the Splitter can perform many functions, it is remarkable that their usage is generally pretty consistent. In essence, we write the parameters of the blit into the blitter registers and then start the operation by writing a value into the blit size register. A typical blitter operation involves up to three data sources named A, B and C. The data is copied to a destination D and is combined using a user-defined logical function. A data source can either be a memory region or a value in a dedicated register. This is determined by the status of the enable bit of the data source's DMA channel. If the enable bit is set, the memory pointer and modular registers are used to fetch data from the specified memory region. If it is cleared, the value stored in the source's data register is used instead. Whether the data coming from each source is actually used in the blit is determined by the logic function. The blitter operation is started as soon as a value is written to the blit size register. Typically that value is the width in 16-bit words and the height in lines. Since memory addresses for the blitter always have to start at a 16-bit boundary and the width always has to be a multiple of 16-bit, we could run into problems if we try to copy data that starts at a different position or is of a different width. Therefore, data sources A and B each allow their data to be shifted to the right. In addition, data source A has two mask registers to mask out unwanted bits. We will see in the examples how this works out in practice. As a warm-up, let's take a look at this simple function. We can use the blitter for general memory copy tasks, not just for image data, and in fact, the Amiga's operating system uses the blitter exactly for that purpose. This function copies very short strings with a length that is a multiple of two characters. When we program in C on the Amiga, we are able to use a variable custom that allows for convenient access to the Amiga's custom chip registers. Because we are going to write to the blitter registers next, we have to make sure that the blitter is currently not in use by other tasks to avoid unexpected side effects. We can do this by calling the waitblit function in the graphics library, and we should always check for the blitter's availability each time we set up a new operation. Next, we specify the source and destination and how to use them. In this simple case, we want a straight copy from the source to the destination, so we enable source A and destination D and set the LF byte, which represents the logic function, to the value hex F0. The value F0 means that the contents of source A is copied to the destination without involving any of the other sources. Here we specify the direction of the blit. The state of the descending bit determines whether the blitter will work from left to right or right to left. More about this in a moment. The rest of the registers are pretty straightforward. We set the A and D pointer registers to the memory addresses of our source and destination. The modulo values will be zero since we will only copy a handful of words from and to linear memory areas. We want to copy all of the requested data from the source A, so we will set all of the bits in the mask registers. 
And since we don't use sources B and C, by convention we will set all of the bits of the data registers. Finally, we set the blit size registers to start the blit. And here we will always assume a height of one line, which we will set into the registers upper 10 bits and the width in words, which we will set into the lower 6 bits. It is worth pointing out that starting with the extended chipset or ECS, the Amiga has additional registers to specify larger blitz sizes. Let's see how a simple copy operation with the blitter looks like. For the sake of simplicity, we will disregard shifts and masks. As I mentioned previously, the blitter can either work in ascending or descending mode. In ascending mode, we start at the top left corner of the blit area. The words are processed in the direction of the increasing addresses from left to right and from top to bottom. When all the words of a line are copied, the modulo for the source is added to the current source address and the modulo for the destination is added to the current destination address to get to the first word in the next line. This is repeated until we reach the end of the blit area. In descending mode, on the other hand, we have to point at the last word of the blit area, which is at the bottom right. The words are processed in the direction of the decreasing addresses, which is from right to left and from bottom to top. When all the words of a line are copied, the modulo for the source is subtracted from the current source address and the modulo for destination is subtracted from the current destination address to get to the last word of the previous line. This is repeated until the beginning of the blit area is reached. In general, if we copy between memory areas that do not overlap, it doesn't matter whether we copy in ascending or descending mode. However, in case the source and destination areas overlap, we have to distinguish whether the destination is located before or after the source area. Let's inspect these two cases a little closer using the example copy function introduced earlier. Let's assume that we want to move a portion of a string by four characters. If we copy in ascending mode, we set the source pointer to the start of the area we want to copy and the destination pointer two words behind that. The result is that the first two words of the string will be copied repeatedly, which is not necessarily what we want. In descending mode, we set the destination pointer to the end of the destination area and the source pointer two words before that. Using this method, the characters of the original string will be preserved after copying. Now we want to move a portion of a string to the left by four characters. In ascending mode, we set the destination pointer to the start of the area we want to copy to and the source pointer two words behind that. This results in all the characters of the original string getting copied. In descending mode, we set the source pointer to the end of the source area and the destination pointer two words before that. With this method, the character sequence GHIJ gets repeatedly copied. I hope these examples make clear that there are cases where the state of the descending bit is important. Before we move on to the next example, I wanted to make a few remarks about logic functions. These affect how the data coming from the blitz sources is combined in an operation. We specify the logic function in the blitcon0 register's low byte. With one byte, there are 256 ways to combine up to three input sources. This is a confusingly huge amount of possibilities, but for example for games, we can get away with less than a handful. In this tutorial, we will only deal with two logic functions, namely the value hex f0, which stands for d equals a, and the value hex ca, which is the so-called cookie cutter function, which is d equals a and b, or not a and c. In our next example, we will copy a graphical object onto the screen using a mask split, also known as a cookie cut. I am using the pink fairy from the arcade classic Rotland here. It's one of my favorite Amiga games. I've prepared two separate PNG images. The first is the tile sheet containing the frames of the fairy. The second is the background image, which is a simple grid with 8x8 eight eight pixel squares, which makes it easier to see positioning and transparency. 
Both images share the same color palette and I pick color 0 as the transparent color for the fairy tile set. Note that both images have a width that is a multiple of 16 pixels, since the blitter works in units of 16 bits. I intentionally created the frames with a width that is not a multiple of 16 pixels so you can see how to use shifts and masks to position the fairy within the destination. I also left a 16 pixel wide empty space between the frames to make shifts easier. In order to use these PNG images we need to convert them into bitplane data that can be used by the Amiga hardware. As in the previous episodes, I am using a make tiles tool to create a tilesheet file. Here I am using it with the background file using the NI switch to generate non-interleaved data. So the planes of the image are arranged one after another. For the fairy frames, I am also creating non-interleaved data. In addition, I specify the size of a frame. And with the CM switch, I am telling make tiles to generate a mask plane. The mask is essentially a bit plane that has a one set in every place where the color is not zero. It will be appended as an additional plane to the regular image data and will be used as the cookie cutter. We will now create a function that selects an object and places it at a specific position. From a high level view, the blitter selects a particular region of the source image and it also needs the mask image to choose which of its pixels should be shown and where the background image should be visible instead. So in this case, source A would be the mask, source B would be the tile sheet, and source C would be the background image. The blitter then uses the function A and B or not A and C to combine the source data into the desired result and places it at the specified position. All right, let's take a look at the code. Here's the first part of the blit object function. And let's take a look at the parameters first. So the Bob's tile sheet contains both image and mask information. Tile X and tile Y specify a frame while dest X and dest Y are actual pixel positions. And the function also assumes that there is a certain amount of padding on the right side of each frame. The first thing we need to determine is how wide our source split is. This first depends on the actual width of our frame without padding and second on the start position within the first word. Here I am showing the tile sheet together with the word boundaries. You can see that each frame occupies at least two but up to three words depending on its position. Next we have to determine the width of our destination blit. The rules are similar to the source blit, but since we want to place the object at any position in the destination, we also need to account for shifts. Just like for the source, we first need to determine the horizontal pixel position relative to the first word by taking its value modulo 16. We then calculate the difference between the destination's first exposition and the tile's first exposition. If the difference is positive, we need to do a shift of that amount of bits to the right. If the difference is negative, we could shift that amount of bits to the left. That would require us to do the blit operation in descent mode. We will instead extend the destination blit region to the left by one word and do a right shift by 16 minus the difference. The effect is similar, but we can stay in ascending mode and do right shifts. I personally find that a bit easier to understand. Let's get a little bit more into detail about shifting, so hopefully things get a little bit clearer. The amount of pixels we want to shift is set in the upper three bits of the registers BlitCon0 and BlitCon1, which affect sources A and B. In our case, those are the mask and the object frames. Three available bits for shift means that we are able to shift between 0 and 15 bits to the right in ascending mode or to the left in descending mode. Let's look at what is happening during a shift using a little example. In this case we do a shift by two bits to the right. For the first word in the blit window two zeros are shifted in from the left and for the following words 
the two bits that are shifted out of the previous word are shifted in. And this is the reason I've added a few pixels of padding between the object frames. Because this means that I'm shifting out the zeros from the padding area into the next line of the blit, so the background will show through on the left side. Without that padding area, we would shift in pixels from the object frame immediately to the right of the frame that we are currently blitting. Unfortunately, padding alone is not sufficient. Due to the shifts, we can run into situations where the destination area will be one word wider than the source area. The consequence is that our actual blit area will be, have to be one word wider than our source frame. That in turn can lead to including unwanted data from the following frame in the source. We can mask that extra word out by setting the ALWM register to zero. Until now, we haven't handled the registers split AFWM and blit ALWM yet, so now would be a good time to introduce them. These registers only apply to source A and are useful when we need to make sure that only certain regions from the front and back of our blit rectangle are copied. This can be the case when the lines of our blit areas do not start or end on exact word boundaries or as in our case, the source and destination sizes are different. The AFWM register is also called source A's first word mask. If you wanted to mask out the first six pixels of each line, you would set the upper six bits of that register to zero. ALWM is source A's last word mask and it applies to the last word of each line in the blit rectangle. In this case, we want to omit the entire 16 pixels, so we set all the bits in that register to zero. Here's what that would do for our first frame. Assuming we would have a three word wide blit, this would ensure that the last word of source A, which is our mass plane, would be all zeros. Since the blitter performs shifting only after applying these two mask registers, we will now only shift zeros out of that area instead of image data. Now that we calculated the blitz size, shift amounts and the masks, we are ready to do the actual blitting by writing to the blitter registers. As we did earlier, we are calling the wait blit function to make sure the blitter is available before we write to any of its registers. Then we can write the source A masks and the A and B shifts to their respective places. Using the final blit width, we can calculate and set the modulos for source, mask and backgrounds and their addresses using the tile and image sizes. Quick remark, addresses and modulos are specified in bytes and odd values are truncated to be even. Finally, we are blitting each plane of the source frame in a loop by writing the addresses and the blitz size and update the pointers at the end of each iteration. Don't forget to call wait blit after every time. The mass pointer actually stays the same, but we still have to write it on each blit. Let's have a quick look at the main function. For the most part, it is the same as in the previous episodes. I'm loading the background and blitter object data and then setting up the copper list, display and a simple event handler. The interesting part is the section where the blit object function is called. You can see that there is an own blitter call at the start and a disown blitter call at the end. Own blitter reserves the blitter exclusively for our task, while disown blitter makes it available to other tasks again. Let's take a look how our example program looks in UAE. Is your head spinning? Mine certainly is. Because of the Blitter's flexibility, it is also the most complex component of the Amiga's chipset. This tutorial is only trying to cover part of its features. Do you have any questions? Let me know in the comments. We will hear about area fill and line draw in one of the next videos to explore more of the Blitter's amazing feature set. Please consider subscribing and activate notifications so you don't miss when I publish new content. Thanks for stopping by and take care.